Travel back in time to the 80s, reliving the music. You can't have the Pretender's first album. That's mine. I bought it. You did not. The catchphrases. Did you have a brain tumor for breakfast? And the wannabes. Sometimes I see you dance around the house in my underwear. Doesn't make me Madonna. Never will. Because just like you, we're stuck in the 80s. Can you say stuck in the 80s? Hey, hey, welcome to Stuck in the 80s. It's your host, Steve Spears. And Brad in LA. And today we have just one thing to say. Well, Kevin Bacon has just one thing to say. I thought this was a party! Let's dance! Stuck in the 80s is now listener supported by Patreon. Join us for VIP Zoom happy hours and more when you join at patreon.com slash stuck in the 80s podcast. Hey, Ladies Nation, we're back, and we are finally ready to talk about something that we have had in the works for a year now. We present the official Stuck in the 80s Top 10 Dance Movies of the 80s. We thank our two exchange students from Lower Swahili, Charles Kibangi and Sunday Ubuki, for recreating the African anteater ritual. But before we get started, since Steve and I have, between the two of us, approximately five left feet, we decided we probably should bring in some help for this one. And so without further ado, I would love to introduce our helpful co-host this episode, Gail in DC and Jen with one app. Hello, everybody. Hi, 80s Nation. Can't wait to groove tonight. Let's groove tonight. This is this is the antith- this is the antithesis of everything that Brad and I fear in a podcast. You know, uh, a, a, a pod- you like to dance though, though, don't you, Brad? I, I enjoy dancing. I, I, I mean, I have, I, we were talking reluctant. about this earlier. I think the reason that I enjoyed dancing wasn't necessarily the dancing itself, but that dancing usually took place in a location that had the ladies present. So that was a big upsell for me. You know, women, you're probably just being fashionably late. You're not I, a dancer, Steve? Reluctant dancer, reluctant dancer. But I, You're a fighter, not a lover or a dancer? It, it, I, do the, I do the putting out the cigarette move, you know, yeah. that was made so famous in the 80s. I mean, um, this is a topic that Steve and I will push back on, have pushed back on many times. Like, oh, it's very visual. We can't possibly do a show, an audio show that's such a visual topic. But. For years, you have pushed back. Four years. It's taken us a year to, to get our act together and like line up our schedules. But previous to that, every once in a while, I'll shoot an email or a text. Hey, guys, want to do that dance podcast? Crickets. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm having, having problems with my people. email. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did you say something? I'm a little deaf in that <laughs> I feel good about this because Jen and Gail were, were on the show three years ago and they guided us through. They, they were the hosts of the Dirty Dancing podcast. You just put your pickle on everybody's plate, college boy, and leave the hard stuff to me. Has that been three years? 2018. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Time slips away. Leaves you with nothing, mister, but boring stories. <laughs> So let me let me ask you a couple questions first before we get started. Did did any of us take dance lessons when we were growing up? Uh, uh, Jen, did you take j- dance lessons? Um, I took dance lessons. I took tap lessons about six or seven years ago. <laughs> it was really hard, but it nice. was also really fun. Yeah, but in in the eighties, no, I don't I don't think I did. Brad, did you? I, I, I don't even know why I'm asking this, but you didn't take dance lessons. Um, I did not, no. Um, I just t- took the usual, you know, the deport- comportment and the gray stuff, you know, walking around with a book on my head. But no, Did you really? Did lessons. they make you do that? No. Come on. I lived in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, don't step in the cow patties. That was Gail, what, about, what about you, Gail? Did you take any uh, dance lessons growing up? Yeah, I took ballet for many years growing up and then a little bit of modern dance. So, yeah. Was- was it something that you wanted to do or is it something that your parents were kind of like, you know, shoved you in that direction? Uh, Good news, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a combination of both. I mean, I started out wanting to do it. Certainly by the time I quit, I was, I was ready to be done. I, I will soon be taking dance lessons for the first time in my life. <gasps> I, I, uh, really? I, I, I have agreed. Or I, I, uh, one of the Valentine's day presents to future wife was a gift certificate for a, uh, wedding dance lessons at arthur murray oh that is very sweet 
That's so, fun. So I'll make sure I have lots of room on my phone for videos. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I hope I hope it goes well. I I I don't have any rhythm whatsoever. That's just complete bullshit. That is complete bullshit. You could do this, Steve. You could do this. Well, I'm gonna, gonna do be, it. It's just, you're gonna I mean, do it, and you're gonna you're gonna do it well, and you're gonna look good doing it. Just you know, be in the moment and enjoy the dance. I've been to I've been to weddings where the couple has this like super choreographed thing, and they're both they look so serious the whole time. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? You're just supposed to be dancing. This we, isn't solid gold. We we've joked that we're going to come back up the aisle to um, uh, safety dance by um, no hats, but I don't I don't think that's really going to happen. But don't be well, surprised. Choreography is real easy, though. We just get a couple of maypoles and a bunch of uh, dwarfs, and we'll be fine. I think you guys should do a whole "I've had the time of my life" recreation. Oh, for your first dance. The lift. <laughs> the lift. Only if we get to do it in a lake. This is my dance space. This is your dance space. So we have a list of top 10 movies. We are not going to rank them. They're they're in somewhat of a chronological order. I, I think we just decided that no sen- it's no sense ranking them. Let's just try to feature 10 movies that we all loved. I mean, how did you all go about picking what movies you're going to talk about today? Gail, how did you pick your movies? For me, it was the movies that I watched in the 80s that I left the theater feeling all fired up, like just movies that made you want to dance, that made you like excited and where the dancing was just a huge energy boost to the movie. So, I mean, you'll see when you get to the ones that I picked, but those are the ones that jump to mind for me. Jen, what about you? I um. When I think of being a kid in the 80s, all I can think of is music and dance and clothes. And I love, I- I've seen all of these movies. I love them all for various reasons. I couldn't possibly rank them. I could tell you probably the ones I enjoyed the most. Um, but I-, I love them all. I think dance was such an important part of the 80s. I mean, I watched Solid Gold religiously. I, you know, we snuck in there through Dance Fever in the 70s, but yeah, dance and music and then videos and all the choreography that happened there. I, I mean, after school, me and my friends would just choreograph, usually to to what a feeling, honestly. <laughs> but uh, I, I love dance. It was an important part. And like the fashions even, it, it, I think it was very influential. The whole dance, the whole dance scene in the decade was pretty important, at least to me. But when I look at magazines and stuff and see leg warmers, I mean, leg warmers came from the world of dance, you know, and then there people are wearing them out in the street, which is very funny when I think about it now, but yeah, it was an important part of the decade. I think. Let me ask you this. Could there be such a thing as a good dance movie? That's also a sad movie. Yeah. (laughs) Like does one come to mind? I thought white nights was kind of <laughs> seems dramatic like a canonical and... answer. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's get started. Uh, we've got 10 movies to cover. We're obviously not going to do a deep dive on all these movies, but we were going to, we're going to tell you what we loved about them and, and, and how important the dance was. It's going to uh, be the uh, junior high book report version. You yeah. want to know how it ends? Read the book. <laughs> yeah. Did you, when you were in junior high, did you basically just steal all your book reports from uh, encyclopedia Britannica? Or is that just a Florida thing? Oh my gosh. No, I actually read books. Oh Jesus. That was a Florida thing. No wonder I'm hosting a podcast instead of writing a important newspaper column for some lofty publication. Okay. Jen and Gail, take it away. So I think we should kick this whole thing off the way the decade kicked off, which was with fame. I don't have to dance anymore. Where you going, Leroy? He's in and I'm out, right? Well, f*** you, Leroy. This was my audition, remember? You're not into high school. This was my audition. We were rehearsing to get me into this school, not you, you f***er. It's just not fair. I didn't want to come here anyway. This school sucks. So I think, in my humble opinion, that this is the movie that started it all, right? So the incomparable, the amazing, the luminescent Debbie Allen was nominated for when this became a show, a TV show, an Emmy for choreography 18 times. And she won three times, two of those for the choreography for that TV show. Um, 
and she won a Golden Globe for Globe for her acting in that show. But okay, let's go back to the movie. Fame, the TV show, was very influential to young Jen with one end. So I thought I would throw that in. But the movie itself um, cost a mere eight point five million to make. And then went on to gross over 42 million worldwide. It's the story, if you guys remember, of the High School of Performing Arts in New York City. Nothing is more exotic to a young child than the streets of New York yeah. City, right? There's something it, to that. Yeah, same, same for me. Like from Oklahoma, I'm like, what is this all about? Right. Amazing. Amazing. So the movie is quite dramatic. It takes this class and and you go through their four years of high school there. Uh, Debbie Allen, as I mentioned, um, plays Lydia, who's the school's head dance teacher. Irene Cara played Coco, um, who was a triple threat. Of course, singing was her her main deal. And then Jean Anthony Ray played Leroy, who was struggling as a student, but an amazing dancer. And I just have to mention Irene Cara, right? Like her voice was everywhere in the early 80s. She sang the theme to fame and then she sang the theme to flash dance, dot, dot, dot. What a feeling. <laughs> or I think I might have gotten that backwards. I might think it might have been what a feeling, dot, 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 flash dance. It's late. I can't recall. It's past Google, eight. Google will, will take either <laughs> answer. So. Um, anyway, this movie was amazing because it was a performing arts high school. There was music, dancing everywhere, literally like on the tables in the cafeteria. There was drama everywhere because, uh, you know, a lot of these kids were also actors. But in the movie itself, it was so dramatic. Like there were ep- there were um, plots about suicide and there was a, a boy who was considering coming out, which at the time was very controversial and difficult um, everywhere. Uh, hot lunch. Do you guys remember that scene? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So recently we talked about um, square pegs and there was an episode we didn't discuss, which included a play that was. I want to say very, <laughs> very similar to the that hot episode lunch. was so problematic. I know, I know, but I, I, I kept thinking about fame the entire time. Anyway, the, I'm the sure kids, they were too when they wrote it. Yeah, exactly. But the kids, they dance everywhere. They dance on top of New York taxi cabs. They dance in fountains. They dance, of course, in dance class, right? And then they have these shows, which gives the movie yet another reason to show these kids doing what they do best. And what I loved about it too was the dancing was ballet and modern and tap and and it was just an amalgam of of the dance world and uh and i really do think it helped to kick off the decade of dance when i asked about sad movies i actually was thinking about this one there, there's so many scenes in this movie that are just kind of dark or creepy kind of gritty or, creepy yeah. morose yeah gritty is a good word to describe it um i i think i think it you you can't argue about its legacy because it 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 spawned the TV show. It spawned a, a Broadway. Wasn't there a Broadway musical version of it at one point? There was. There was a 2009 remake that had Kelsey Grammer and BB Newworth, which fixed the bad acting of the original movie, but at the expense of the charm that the original that the first mm. movie had. Can we talk about this soundtrack? <laughs> of course. These these songs, like I, I was pretty young I was I guess I was 11 when this movie came out and I I didn't really understand like what the movie was about it I couldn't appreciate it but the I just remember these songs like out here on my own dogs in the yard I sing the body electric which remains one of my favorite songs today and then of course the title song like what an amazing soundtrack this was Yeah, it was good. I think of the opening notes to the the theme song, and it yeah. always like, gets my blood flowing. Absolutely, it's a great uh, workout soundtrack. Like these songs are good to get your energy going. The next movie on our list does not get your energy moving really. <laughs> uh, this is 1980s Urban Cowboy. Do you two step? You bet. I'll prove it. All right. There's no. a sad, sad dance movie for you, Steve. You know why it's sad? Because it's all country and western. Uh, I, I can, what makes Brad cry? I can hear the eyeballs out there in podcast land. Like, 
circling back in your heads and you're wondering why, Steve, would you put Urban Cowboy on this list? A couple of reasons. One is John Travolta. John Travolta was the king of the dance movies, if, if you think about it. He was in Greece, yeah. Saturday Night Fever, Staying Alive, and even the, the movie that we never name check, but still, <laughs> I still enjoy it, The Experts from the late 80s. Everyone has remembers this movie, and you may think of this as this huge pop culture juggernaut, but it really didn't make a lot of money. It wasn't a big success. It grossed about just under $50 million and landed at 13th place on the year-end list for the year for 1980, which is nothing to sneeze at, but it was not a giant blockbuster. But what it did do was it put Mickey Gilly on the map, and the country music just exploded from there not that i could have told not that i would have noticed because oklahoma was already soaking in country music at the time Uh, he went from being a star in the 70s to being a superstar in the in the 80s he had nine number one hits in the early 80s including looking for love in all the wrong places and a cover stand by me which both showed up in the movie i think what's interesting about this movie is that it was based on a true story Esquire magazine wrote a story called the ballad of the urban cowboy America's search for true grit. And it was about uh, a real life couple who were regulars at Gillies and who met and married. And that yeah. story inspired the, you know, Hollywood to turn it into a movie. It features a kind of, now here's where it's interesting because obviously this is a, a dance, a dance movie, a dance podcast, the dancing you see in this one is the Texas two-step. The very first job I ever had was working for a, this seedy little weekly business journal in Tampa. And I had to write a story about a, a, a dance studio that was opening up that only taught two-step. And so I had to go there one night and try to take photos. And they actually tried to teach me the two-step, but they gave up after about 45 seconds because it was just never going to work out. But um, that is what we see. And if you if you think back to the movie, that is how um, John Travolta and Deborah Wing- Winger meet is her asking him, can you, you know, do, do you two step? Can you prove it? And so the movie revolves to some degree around the two step. Um, and as is obligatory for me in any podcast, uh, obligatory Xanadu reference, John Travolta turned down a role in Xanadu to appear in Urban Cowboy. How's you that know- for synergy? John, good call. I get my slow clap award of the podcast to you, John Travolta. I love that Urban Cowboy and Fame came out in the same year. It's so weird. Really yeah, cool. Just different sides of the quarter. Hey, and Brad, just just uh, I feel bad for dropping Xanadu on you, so I'm gonna I'm gonna save it a little bit by by with a Silverado reference. <gasps> uh, um, I feel better already. At the end of Urban Cowboy, Scott Glenn, who plays the villain attempts to steal from the bar uh, managed by James Gammon. A few years later, forgot he's in this. (laughs) Silverado, Scott Glenn would again steal from James Gammon, although uh, Glenn was the good guy stealing back the loot that Gammon's gang stole from the wagon truck. I think there's only a couple of them guys, and this guy's one of them. (laughs) Silverado, Uh, another famous 80s dance movie. I know there's some dancing in that, but mainly when you to dance away from bullets our next selection is um so nice they made they made it twice uh jen take it away the next one they actually made two and released them in the same year break in one and two you lost your edge you're the loser punk try me come back Attention, you have just entered a battle zone. It's time for us to find out who's really the best with the freshest crew. No time for words, we're through with that. All there is left is pure combat. 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 There's no stopping us. There's don't no do that. Don't put that one in my head because that that is an earworm that stays there for months. So I won't spend too much time on this, even though I'm going to mention about six movies right now. (laughs) But we covered a lot of this during our um, Shabadoo tribute show a few episodes ago, several episodes ago. Um, But I did want to mention it because break-in was a huge break-in breakdancing was a huge part of 
dance in the 80s, right? Um, Absolutely. Like I said, these were released in 1984 because Canon Films and <laughs> the producers love money and um, can smell a trend when they when can smell a trend when they smell it. You can just take that right out. <laughs> but it happens by. Ain't no stopping, Jen. No stopping. Um, all right. So we talked about in that episode, the incredible break and moves of Shabadoo and Boogaloo Shrimp, who were dancers and then became kind of actors after appearing in this movie and its sequel. Um, some other movies about hip hop that, of course, of course, involve break dancing because that is a critical part of hip hop. Crush Groove, Beat Street, Fast Forward and Body Rock. And I did mention in the other tribute show about fast forward which is actually um produced by sydney portier and very oh, corny yeah. very corny the dancing is also very corny but it's super interesting um and i don't think we talked about this last one so i'm gonna finish with it but it's another movie that came out in 1984 that tried to capitalize on the break in trend and it's called body rock starring everyone's favorite break dancer Lorenzo Lamas. <laughs> what? So, <laughs> yes, I know. It's it's something. Um, so to and prepare, Mr. Green Jeans on the bass. <laughs> so to prepare for our conversation tonight, I watched the movie trailer <laughs> of Body Rock, and actually, it looks like there might be some really good legit dancers in it. Um, but also, Lorenzo Lamas is in it. Who? Um, not for nothing was nominated for worst actor at the fifth golden raspberry awards but lo lost to sylvester stallone in rhinestone a long time ago we did a podcast about act actors trying to be singers and singers trying to be actors i don't know if we covered rhinestone and i'm okay with that yeah the less said the better here's a movie though that's that's worth saying a lot about gail what's your next pick so my pick is 1983's flash dance you know the truth is you're scared shitless of going to that place, aren't you? I am not. Yes, you are. And you're using me as an excuse not to go. Get out. I'm just gonna piss it all away, Alex. Don't you understand? When you give up your dream, you die. All right, so despite having an entire year to prepare for this episode, I thought I would have more time and I didn't watch some of the movies that you guys were just talking about. So I, I couldn't really participate in the breaking conversation, but flash dance, I did watch again. And I remembered it from watching it way back when. So um, for those people who are unfamiliar with this movie, which has to be like one person, this is the Cinderella story about a teenager. She's actually 18 years old, which is kind of insane when you think about it. Uh, named Alex, who works in a um, steel mill in Pittsburgh, I guess. And she, by day, works in the steel mill, but she has aspirations to be a dancer. So she um, dances in a uh, nightclub at night, but she really, really would love to do ballet. So um, she f gets involved with her boss and uh, ends up trying out for the ballet and of course ends up making it. But the story, which is paper thin is really <laughs> eclipsed by the, uh, the trends, the dancing and the soundtrack, which I think basically revolutionized movie soundtracks and had a tremendous impact on fashion of the eighties. I mean, that, that iconic sweatshirt hanging off the shoulder, which I guess Jennifer Beals just kind of did on a whim, like her shirt was felt too tight. So she just cut the neck out of it. And, you know, the, the scissors that launched like a massive trend from, oh my you gosh, know, yeah. for years and years and years. See it every um, year on the eighties cruise. I'll guarantee it. I'm sure. So this was the third biggest movie of 1983 behind return of the Jedi in terms of endearment it had the hottest movie soundtrack since Greece, which had been five years earlier, knocked thriller temporarily from the top of the album chart and won uh, Grammy album of the year and also a best original song Oscar for Irene Cara of fame fame um, who did, who performed flash dance um, which also beat out another song nominated from the movie Maniac. Wow. Um, 
this, what was kind of cool about this movie is that there were a lot of different styles of dance included in it. So uh, it incorporated break dancing, which Jen was just talking about. Um, there was the dance she did in the club, which had all kinds of different elements to it. There was lots of kind of very intense cardio, like working out type things. There was actually skating in this movie. I don't know if you guys remember, but her, her colleague was an ice skater. Um, and then of course it ends with um, the kind of genre shattering audition where she starts doing ballet and then ends up break dancing in it. She did use body doubles for a number of things. She used a different body double for her dancing, for her ballet dancing and her break dancing. And the break dancer body double was actually a guy, which is kind of funny. Which you can totally tell too. If you look, yeah, if you look really carefully. <laughs> And there was like this French actress who played, uh, who did a lot of her um, dancing doubles. And she really, if you look carefully, it really doesn't look all that much like Jennifer Beals. She, she was her biking double too. So whenever she was on her bicycle, that was her double. Oh, so what did Jennifer, again, did Jennifer do anything do, other than right. cut a sweatshirt? <laughs> she whipped her sweaty hair around. Yeah. She, an she, was, there a, was there a stunt double for the bucket too? She ate some lobster. <laughs> so. Right. She did eat some lobster. Um, this, uh, soundtrack, the album won Grammy award. I think I mentioned that already. Um, it also had some other famous songs on it. Um, lady, 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 Gloria by Laura Branigan. Um, I have to say that I watched this movie. I was 13 years old. I had really no idea what was going on. Like I did not get it. I, I, I didn't sort of understand like how inappropriate her relationship was with her boss, and the fact is she was 18 years old. I'm the mother of two 17 year olds. So I find it really horrifying that she was only <laughs> one year older than them when this supposedly yeah. happened. It's also incredibly unrealistic in every way, but God, what a movie it was. It was great. I just remember walking out of the theater and like, just feeling like I could like take on the world. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know if this is an apocryphal story or, or if it's true, but Evidently, it was between Jennifer Beals, who was cute as a button, by the way, in this movie, it was between Jennifer Beals and Demi Moore. And supposedly, the director asked the Teamsters on the set who they would rather rather take on and date, we'll say. Uh, and they went with Jennifer Beals. So, well, yeah. I don't know that I feel good about that. Uh, yeah, I, I think we all are landing in Gail's camp here. Like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, it was oh, a different wow. time. <laughs> yeah, it was that, that's a true. Time. That's true. Speaking of different times, I bring you back, ladies and gentlemen, to the height of the Cold War in 1985, <laughs> to give you the noir classic known as White Knights. Seven rubles against my tape recorder. No, 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 no. I got ten rubles. I want 10 pirouettes for it. Be serious. I'm very serious. This isn't ice skating rink. It's impossible. 10 rubles, 10 pirouettes. You're a betting man. Wait a minute. 11 rubles. 11 pirouettes. Okay, so who, who here, raise a hand, because we're on video, I can see you. Who, who's seen this movie all, all the way through? <laughs> I have uh, seen this movie all the way through. I, I tried to watch it this week and I only made it halfway, but I had to, I had seen it in the eighties. So, so from the moment that the idea of a top 10 dance podcast was conceived a year ago, uh, future wife and I ha had, had made the pledge that we would watch this uh, together because she had never seen it. And I hadn't seen it probably in 20 or 30 years. We just finished it last night. I mean, we really just, we beat the buzzer by, <laughs> mere hours um so assuming a lot of you out there have not seen it i will give you a very very short recap uh, a russian american ballet dancer uh is has defected from russia but is in an airplane that's forced to land in the ussr where he's repatriated against his will he's forced to stay with an american man who's married to a russian woman will the american help help them flee the ussr it's all sounding a little vague and stupid, but remember, this was the film debut of Mikhail Baryshnikov. Dancers yes. who wanted to become actors. Dancers who wanted to become actors, a very short list. But he was, he was being sought after by Hollywood for a movie. He agreed to this one under like several conditions. One, 
when the actor spoke Russian, it had to be grammatically correct. It had to be like right on the money. It couldn't be like that nonsensical hybrid that's often used in American movies. He insisted that a couple scenes be filmed with him speaking French because in real life, that was his second language, not English. And that the movie had to be filmed in a situation. The White Nights basically refers to um, the time of year around the Arctic Circle where the sun never really sets. It, it's seemingly daylight all the time for a, a large portion of the year. In 1985, you could not film in Leningrad and Siberia where this movie is based. So instead, uh, we are given the, the lovely coast of Finland, which hmm. looks about as depressing as you could possibly hmm. imagine. But it was filmed during the White Nights so that you would have that eerie, spooky look to the sky that that made this movie so atmospheric is that wrong that's not the right word no that's a good that's a good no, that's right did you notice um the scenes where they actually did have to do it in leningrad how fake the backgrounds were while they're driving it looked so bad i i i, I pointed that out specifically last <laughs> night i was like i can't it, it almost looked like like a naked gun episode that the backgrounds were so, <laughs> yeah or was, snl like it looked yeah. so it just like it was sad. Yeah. Right. Gregory Hines, by the way, plays the American. So what you see in this movie, and this is why I think it's a great dance movie. It, it is basically ballet and tap the two of the masters of those art forms together performing and then kind of almost creating their own new style from that as, as the movie uh, moves forward. So if you, if you are curious about either one of those formats, you're going to see it performed at the height of its talent critics hated this movie they called it uh, high concept but low intelligence it has a 46 percent fresh rating on rotten Tomatoes. wow i mean i don't remember it as being this amazing must watch every year when the sun doesn't set kind of movie but that's harsh it is it's weird it's just it's not that bad it, um the director taylor hackford would meet his future wife helen mirren on the set of this uh, movie she's she looks like she's 23 years old yeah she's yeah. great mikhail uh barishnikov looks 28 years old it's just it's just interesting to see gregory hines on the other hand looks like he's 58 but it's still all those still winters a, have broken him down yeah it, and it's also by the way the film debut of uh, isabella rossellini so is it really yep wow even, so it, it's it's I still think it's a fun movie. You you can rent it on Amazon Prime. I bought it just because I'm just weird about it for some reason. There's something about it I like. When when I was a senior in high school, um, they used to have a feature in our school newspaper where they would go and talk to a someone who had graduated the year before or the a couple of years before and kind of, kind of catch up with them and see what they're up to. And when I was a senior, they were catching up with this guy who was a dance and drama prodigy in high school and he had moved from straight from high school to new york to try to make it in dance wow and broadway and he, he didn't but what he did do and he, and he talked about in the article was he wandered the streets of manhattan like for hours a day listening to separate lives on his walkman performed by phil collins and, and marilyn martin Oh my gosh. And so to this day, when I hear that song, I think of that poor guy. And like, if he just, you know, did a Hail Mary for his dreams and just, I just think of him wandering the streets of Manhattan, still listening to that song. And um, oh. it conjures up, it conjures up memories of this movie and um, it will conjure up memories of some of the movies that we're about to talk about too. So. You have no to say that Gregory Hines and Mikhail Brishnikov are so uh, charismatic in this movie. Yes. Great chemistry. And, yeah, I just love to watch them. I love to watch them dance. I love to watch them argue. I love to watch them 
plan this gape spoiler but yeah i i thought i think they make the movie i think they make a kind of slow movie um pretty compelling question for you do you think that the right song won the academy award no. so both <laughs> say you say me and separate lives were nominated and say you say me won i think it's criminal um it's not even, it's not even used until the closing credits I agree. You don't, you don't hear it until the closing credits. It has nothing to do with the movie, as far as I can tell. Uh, Separate Lives plays a couple times. No, it's Separate Lives should have won like a hundred times over. Yeah. Even Lionel Richie would probably would say that. I think Say You Say Me also, as I think about the lyrics, makes no sense. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no. Every once in a while. Like, oh, so now songs have to make sense to win awards? We're in trouble. Well, yeah, <laughs> point taken. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you don't like it, you don't like it. I just I, didn't we just talk about this? Were, weren't you kind of salty about this a few weeks ago, Steve? Me? Salty? I know. Shocking. With your blood pressure? <laughs> With your bad back, Ed, I wouldn't. I wouldn't throw anybody. <laughs> uh, bringing up Gregory Hines, though, he makes the list a second time. Uh, Jen, what movie does he appear in that you love so much? So I am bringing everyone 1989. So we're later in the decade here. But it's a movie called Tap. Now, I know you guys were good in your day, but since you ain't got no legs anymore, there's no reason. Hey, 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 hey. What do you mean? You think we ain't got no legs? Is that what you're saying? Sam, man, come in here. Come in here. You know what this young man said? We ain't got no legs. That means I ain't got no legs, you ain't got no legs, and them men in there ain't got no legs. Now, what does that sound like to you? A challenge. Now, I ain't challenged nobody. Oh, yes, you did. So in Tap, Gregory Hines stars as Max Washington, a hoofer, that's what they call him, a hoofer, who learned everything he knows from his dad, Sonny. And so Sonny owned a tap dance studio, but passes away before the start of the film. So Sammy Davis Jr. plays Little Mo and his daughter Amy, played by Suzanne Douglas. They run the dance studio that Sonny used to own, named appropriately Sonny. And they live there, Little Mo, Amy, and her son, Louis, who is played by the adorable, at the time, dancers Savion Glover, who, by the way, debuted on Broadway at the age of 11. Jeez. Yeah. So anyway, Gre- Gregory Hines, who looks so fine, you guys, and actually much buffer than he did in White Knight. So he really worked out to be in this movie. He comes home from prison because he was a jewel thief and blah, blah, blah. Oh, my like, gosh. Really, none I, now of this I'm matters. really interested. None, <laughs> none of this plot matters because the movie is at its finest and so comes alive when people are tap dancing. I mean, that's just, it's called tap. It's not called jewel heist. Oh, man. It's, and that's for a reason. But I will say that the jewel heist, which puts him in Sing Sing at the very beginning of the movie, there's this great opening scene of Gregory Hines tap dancing in his cell. And it's just the, the way it's lit is kind of flash dancey, but it's really, it's really, really good. And, and Gregory Hines style is so innovative and interesting um, that whenever he tap dances, I'm just like riveted to the screen. So what I like about this movie, um, besides Gregory Hines and just oozing charm and talent is that the director, Nick Castle shoots tap old school. We haven't really talked about that much yet, but we get to see the dancer's whole body. There's no wigs and like foot clothes, you know, muscular ups, arms yeah. that are right. Right. Like it's, it, it's just the dancer doing the dance. And I love that. And I think that it, it, that's, that's something different that happened in the eighties, which is maybe why when people think of dance movies, they don't ne- necessarily go straight to the eighties because a lot of it feels more like a video than an actual dance, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Um, But Heinz, who is just the best, um, he, we see a lot of dancing from him, of course, but then we also get to see Sammy Davis Jr., who sadly, this was his last movie. 
and his old pals, right? They're still amazing. And there are all these veteran dancers like Harold Nicholas. I'm going to say a bunch of these names because I only knew a couple of them, but they are so still at this time. So good. Harold Nicholas, Arthur Duncan, Bunny Briggs, Jimmy Slide, Howard Sims, and Steve Condos. They play these old guys who are playing cards and then they come in and then let it rip. And I'm like, oh my God, they've got to be like 60, 70 years old and while this movie is taking place. And, and the guys are just also very um, tap. I think the best tap dancers have a lot of charisma and it just made me smile to watch them. And then we also get a nod to the next generation, right? Because um, Savion Glover has this really fun scene where he teaches other cl- kids um, tap in, in one of the classes. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, it's really fun. It's shot like a musical, but again, the plot hardly matters because Gregory Hines is just everything in this movie. I mean, at the beginning, you see the credits and he is listed as an improv, I'm trying to say this, improvographer. So he's got an idea of what he's going to do, but then he just does what his feet and body and heart lead him to do. And I yeah. think that's amazing. And it's, it's fun to watch it captured on film. And then there's a long dance finality at the end, which a lot of these movies tend to have. And again, some plot about these rigged up da- tap shoes that like incorporate like synthesizers and, and all kinds of stuff, but it's super percussive and really fun. Um, and I, and I just, I loved this movie. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think a lot of people know uh, Gregory Hines died in 2003 of liver cancer. But then, and I forgot about this, in 2019, the Postal Service issued a stamp honoring him, which I thought was lovely. That's nice. Yeah. And I'm just going to do something that I never do, but in honor of Steve. <laughs> I, I was curious what Roger Ebert thought, because Steve, just um, you hold Roger Ebert's word as in such high regard. But here, here's what he says. What we have here then is the outline for a fairly standard musical plot. Will Max steal the jewels or return to his dancing heritage? Will Max and Amy fall in love again? Parts of this plot seem recycled out of old musicals, all right, but the spirit of the film is fresh and the characters are convincing. So I'm going to guess of all these movies, Tap is the one that most people listening haven't seen. It's streaming a bunch of places. You can rent it for a couple of days. And it's even if you don't pay attention to any of the jewel thieving or the business plot stuff, the dancing is worth a couple of bucks. Nice. Brad, what do you got for us? I can't believe I'm going to have to follow that act with this, but here we go, kids. It's <laughs> girls just want to have fun. Hey, hold it there, buddy. It's not your buddy. You see that young woman out there? Yeah. She's my daughter. Janie's your daughter? Well, all right. She's the greatest. It, it, just look at her dance out there. She's awesome, man. Sir, look at her. That movie we just talked about, Tap, that we just talked about is like a, a gourmet meal with many courses and fine wine served alongside it. Girls Just Want to Have Fun is cotton candy and funnel cakes. And who doesn't like some cotton candy and funnel cakes sometimes? This movie was released in the spring of 1985, and it follows our friend from last episode, Sarah Jessica Parker, on her way to being a, in the city. Uh, She's a new girl in town and she meets uh, Lynn played by Helen Hunt, which has got to be one of her first, if not her first role. Uh, And both share a uh, overwhelming passion for a dance television show called dance TV. I don't know where they come up with these names (laughs) Uh, together. They enter a competition to be a new dance TV, regular couple, but someone's dad doesn't approve. Who could that be? Janie's father doesn't approve. This is like a, in some ways I was thinking about, um, music videos as dance movies. And this is like a music video stretched to theatrical length with some dialogue instead of, you know, some long haired guy singing in the background. And <laughs> I, I know I'm saying some stuff about, maybe I'm being a little harsh on this. I watched this and I really enjoyed it. It is absolute fluff, but it's still fun. So it turns out this movie was indeed inspired by Cindy Lauper's song, you know, girls just want to have fun. The studio was forced to buy the rights to the song. However, as you might have remembered from previous podcasts, Cindy didn't write this song. Oh, well, that's right. Um, it's a cover. It's, so her version's a cover. So the song that appears in the movie is, is a cover version of girls just want to have fun. 
she does appear in the movie. She's like an uncredited appearance as a woman in a diner. There's a lot of people who make some sort of weird cameo appearances. Hank Azaria, Gina Gershon, Robert Downey Jr. They're all like these little kind of tiny bit roles. Quick cameos. Um, and reviewers weren't that kind. It was a bust at the box office. I think, you know what, for this to have been a bust at the box office, it had to just be completely mismarketed or released at the wrong time. Like it was released at, you know, the height of Oscar season or something. Cause this is a fun movie. This, I, I can see a marketing campaign that brings this, brings this in some cash. You know who I think doomed this movie? Richard Blade. Yeah. I'll get on board with that. He plays the host of dance TV. So I have to chime in here because I saw this movie in the most perfect of um, conditions. When I was a kid, I was at a slumber party Oh, (laughs) and it was the perfect movie for a bunch of girls (laughs) who did like to dance and loved Cyndi Lauper and loved crazy clothes. Um, I, I saw this movie again with my, who was at my daughter who was 10 at the time. Um, kind of about a year ago when we started talking Mm -hmm, about doing this show. But, um, but she said to me that she loved it and that it was much better than Xanadu. And I couldn't disagree. (laughs) It made sense to me. And I just have to say, I I, I made a bunch of notes. I just wanted to mention that one of our favorite Heathers, Shannon Doherty, isn't it? I just have to, as a, as a little sister. And then Jonathan Silverman, who, shows up in things showed up in this. And I, I, this note is funny, but I really, really mean it. I wrote, Helen Hunt is a star. She is so good in this movie. And I just want to like make everyone else go away and just watch Helen Hunt do Helen Hunt things on, on screen. It's very strange that I say that because I find her kind of boring now, but in this movie, she is just luminescent. Do you think this is where she met Hank Azaria? Oh, maybe, maybe. Oh, they were married for a long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you're you're right, Jen. She steals anytime she's on the screen. She just owns the scene. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's it's a uh, there's lots of clothes in this scene too, which is is good for a young woman. Which, so what you're saying is that night this was 1985's version of Pitch Perfect, basically. Not a terrible analogy. What's next on the list, Gail? Okay, so the next movie is one that has been covered on this show before, as we talked about, Dirty Dancing from 1987. Sorry about the disruption, folks. But I always do the last dance of the season. But this year, somebody told me not to. So I'm going to do my kind of dancing with a great partner who's not only a terrific dancer, but somebody who's taught me that there are people willing to stand up for other people no matter what it costs them. Somebody who's taught me about the kind of person I want to be. Miss Frances Hassel. So this has been done on the show, so I won't get too into it, but um, this is the movie that takes place in the 60s in the Catskills at a Jewish summer resort. Um, the Jewish family, Baby, played by Jennifer Grey, uh, and her sister and parents go on vacation for a week, and she meets Johnny Castle, played by Patrick Swayze, who plays the dance instructor, a coming of age film where she uh, falls in love with Johnny Castle as he's teaching her to dance all done on the DL because they're secretly trying to enter into or perform at a uh, I don't know some dance show at another resort all kinds of like slightly unnecessary subplots Um, it's basically a movie about falling in love through dance Um, It has the most amazing and iconic finale of pretty much any movie I've ever seen with the possible exception of the Shawshank Redemption. And it, (laughs) (laughs) the soundtrack, uh, the song I've had the time of my life won golden globe Academy award for best original song, Grammy award for best duet. So the song, that final dance that they do together is just, you know, larger than the movie itself. And I hope
What I love about the ending is it's been replicated and imitated so many times, especially in my favorite Super Bowl ad ever. Do you guys remember that Super Bowl ad from like two years ago? So well done. Oh, so well done. Was that Peyton Manning? I'm not good on football. uh, Peyton Manning. Eli uh, Manning. One of those. Eli Manning. Sorry. I'm not good on the quarterbacks. Um, Anyway, this is, I mean, I don't know how you could possibly make this list of dance movies from the 80s and not include this. It's just... You know, the dancing was great. It was kind of a combination of some kind of traditional ballroom dancing. And then there was this underground dirty dancing part of it where the staff would go after, you know, after hours and do this like, you know, scandalous, much more suggestive sexual dancing and um, hence the title of the movie. So I don't know what more there is to say. I just have one thing to say about this. I carried the watermelon. (laughs) exactly i mean it's it's silly in so many ways and the lyrics i mean the some of the lines are stupid like nobody puts baby in a corner and i carried a watermelon but i this is a movie that if it comes on i will never ever ever turn it off it's just irresistible i think also here here's the um here's an instance of a choreographer being kind of the star of the movie we haven't talked Mm -hmm. about that too much um but Kenny Ortega doing his Kenny Ortega ist thing, you know, I think he, um, his choreography was a really the star of the show. Cause, cause whenever this list makes a eighties dance, I am always like, well, it's, it's not really, you know, the same argument you guys always have, like it's not set in the eighties, but right. he choreographs it so modern and the music is also a mix of old and modern. So mm-hmm. I think it, I think it counts. I, I, I give it a, I, I in, reluctantly endorse it as a as a great dance movie, even though I don't really want to watch it again. <laughs> Darn thoughtful of you. <laughs> one movie though that I'll never turn off whenever it comes on TV is this one uh, from the summer of 1983. Cast your mind way back to the movie Staying Alive. I just wanted to tell you that I think you're an incredible dancer. Thank you very much. I'm a friend of Jackie Coles. Uh, I'm Tony Monero. Oh, it's important to have friends. Yeah, I was just saying that this morning over breakfast. Did you want something? An autograph or something? I, I'd like to get together with you and maybe talk sometime. Would that be possible? About what? About how incredible you are. Thank you, but I do already know that. Say so what? Hmm, I already know. Well, in case you don't know this, I used to be pretty incredible myself when I lived in Brooklyn. Really? What happened? I moved to Manhattan. <laughs> mm-hmm. Who remembers the sequel to uh, Saturday Night Fever? Everyone here watch this one? I haven't seen it, but I remember we aired it at the Show West Theater just outside Weatherford, Oklahoma for one week before it came out. There. I saw this when it came out. It was horrible. I saw this in the theater and I loved it so much that um, later that month it was in the cheap theaters and I was allowed to bring some friends for my birthday to see a movie. And this is the movie I chose. Oh, <laughs> nice. For those who, who didn't care to watch it, it basically it is John Travolta reviving his role as Tony Monero, uh, a former disco dancer from Brooklyn who now lives in a flop house in Manhattan and works as a waiter in a dance club while he auditions during the day for roles on Broadway. It is one of only a handful of movies from the 80s to have a 0.00 fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Does that really? That seems low. (laughs) You know how the audience meter is different? The audience meter is only 39%. Oh, well, hey. Uh, The other, by the way, in case case you're wondering, the other movies from the 80s with a zero rating, Bolero, Jaws the Revenge, uh, Police Academy 4, and Return of the Living Dead Part 2. So, hmm. There you go. Well, at least he's not alone down there at the bottom. Here's the thing, though: John Travolta's not a bad dancer. He's a good dancer. He's in great shape. He has great chemistry with Cynthia Rhodes, uh, who plays his on again, off again girlfriend, and who appears in practically every other movie on the list in today's podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not mm-hmm. wrong. Yeah, three of the other ones. It also includes uh, is her name Fanola Hughes? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, who. If you watched soap operas in the 80s, you obviously re- remember her from General Hospital. 
now now her acting is truly atrocious in this movie <laughs> and for her for her performance alone it deserves a, the zero percent rating in fact i think i'm pretty sure she received a uh she's one of um one of i think four people in the movie to get a uh, golden raspberry award <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but um what's what i think is kind of sad about it is for a sequel it only has one an character's appearance tony's mom is back for like two scenes that's it for the most part it's a brand new story you don't even really need to have watched saturday night fever so if you're worried that this is like star trek star trek to the wrath of khan i assure you it is not mm. um, but there's a lot of cameos i think everyone kind of knows sylvester stallone who uh, directed and co-wrote it he bumps into tony while he's walking down the street frank stallone sly's uh, brain dead brother uh, appears in the movie in a club band. Richie Sambora is uh, in the club band. I nice. guess Donna Pescow, uh, who was in the original movie, she was supposed to appear in the audience at the Broadway show, but her scene was deleted. So, so there you go. It's not a bad movie. <laughs> when you know when you know when you phrase it, it's not. It's not a bad movie. When you when you have to say it that way, you know it's kind of a bad movie. But it it still does a good job, I think, of representing dance in the eighties. I think it's also not really a sequel you know when you when you when you think of saturday night fever that feels gritty and it feels so yeah like a whole other thing and for the first time as you were talking steve i was thinking about how greece was and then how greece 2 was and this kind of feels like the same not really it's, a sequel so as, as, there's no it just kind of moves the story ahead by five years and starts the, it up again pretty much yeah. i mean <clears throat> yeah, the through line is is there is one character and now we're seeing what his life is like now. That's you know, it's a completely different story with one character. Exactly. Um this next movie though, I think is an 80s legend when it comes to dancing. Um and so we trust it in the care of Gale. So I'm going to close things down with 1984's Footloose. Aren't we told in in Psalm 149 Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Let them praise his name in the dance. Amen. Amen. And it was King David. King David, who, who we read about in, in Samuel. And, and, and what did David do? What did David do? What did David do? David <laughs> danced before the Lord with all his might, leaping, leaping and dancing before the Lord, leaping and dancing. So Footloose uh, takes place in Brad's birthplace, Elmore City, Oklahoma. Mm, incorrect. Well, same state. <laughs> okay, well, your pivotal years were spent in Oklahoma. Were you allowed to dance? Oh, yeah, we're not cavemen. I went to many a dance at the Weatherford High School gym. Well, it's based at the on... feed store. <laughs> yeah, actually, the there was one warehouse. at the Armory once, but never at a feed, never in the basement of a feed store. So this was based on a city in Oklahoma which had banned dancing, and well, in 1979. Hold on just a second. Call it a city is to is I'm sorry. to uh, give a it town. a lot more credit than it deserves. A town in Oklahoma called uh, Elmore City which had banned dan dancing. Uh, in 1979, the kids of Elmore had asked to have a prom and the town agreed and they had the prom. So the screenwriter for this movie, Dean Pitchford, he went to visit the town and wrote the script. He incidentally is the guy who wrote the lyrics for the songs Fame, Red Light, and I Sing the Body Electric. Right. Huh. So wow. this is such an iconic movie um but what's amazing is you know we of course you can't imagine this movie without kevin bacon but the first choice to play the role of wren was tom cruise and then rob lowe auditioned for it but he blew out his acl while he was uh auditioning for the movie and couldn't perform he obviously mm -hmm. couldn't get the part and it went to kevin bacon so the flash dance body doubles weren't available <laughs> there were body doubles in here um, but, uh, 
those were, uh, of course, having to look like Kevin Bacon. Um, Madonna auditioned for the role of Ariel, which went to Laurie Singer. Uh, rounding out the cast, we have Diane Wiest and John Lithgow as the minister Shaw Moore and his wife and the father of Ariel. So um, talking about the dancing for this movie, Kevin Bacon did three weeks of dance training for it. He said he had no idea what he was getting himself into and didn't realize how intense it would be. He also did gymnastics training, although he did have both a dance and a gymnastics body double. Um, apparently he wore very tight pants in the movie and then they told him they wanted his pants to be even tighter to make him look powerful when he was dancing. So when you think about his incredible, excuse me, I gotta go order some tight pants. (laughs) I'm I'm very powerful. Um, it was trying to make him look good when he danced. Um, can I share a fun, a fun fact about please. So Maureen Jahan is the French dancer and actress that you had mentioned in when you're talking about flash dance, who was a double for Jennifer Beals. She used to be married. They've been divorced for years now, but she was married to Peter Tram, who was the body double for Kevin Bacon in Footloose. Do you think they would spend time at night talking about how frustrated they were that they didn't get credit for the dancing? I don't, I think they were divorced by the time that they were in these movies, but I'll never Uh, forget that there was a people magazine about all this dance phenomenon. Oh my gosh. And I read this fact about um, the two body doubles and it must've been about eight years old. Never forgot it. Just, just (laughs) locked in there. I've always known that fact. And speaking of fun facts, if you ever get a chance to watch the extras um, about Footloose and the creation of it, they're really good. They're really, really good. Do you want to kiss me? Someday. What is this someday shit? Well, I, I get the feeling you've been kissed a lot. You know, I'm afraid I'd suffer by comparison. I have always wondered about the name Wren. Like, that's an unusual name. And I read an article uh, on the internet that uh, apparently Wren was uh, an amalgam, kind of a combination of the two kids' names that tried to organize, that did organize the first prom Rex oh. Kennedy and Leonard Coffey. Oh, oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. That's a nice little hat. That's tip. cool. That's yeah. cool. Um, music was a huge part of this movie. Um, the soundtrack had uh, Hurt So Good, Waiting for a Girl Like You, Dancing in the Sheets. And then, of course, the songs we all know from the movie Footloose, um, I'm Free, Holding Out for a Hero, Let's Hear It for the Boy, Somebody's Eyes. Um, the first two tracks received, uh, the first two tracks hit number one. I think that's, um, Footloose and let's hear it for the boy maybe. And, uh, they got, uh, Academy Award nominations for best music and for original song. Sadly, they lost out Footloose, uh, let's hear it for the boy and Footloose both lost out uh, and, and also against all odds to the woman in red's. I just called to say, I love you. Oh Oh, no. Tragic miscarriage of justice. Yes. Let's get in the podcast time machine. We got some stuff to fix. (laughs) Yes. Also great finale here. That final prom scene where they get to dance in the end. And miraculously, they all know the choreography, despite the fact that they've never danced before. There's break dancing. As break dancing, those break dancers were actually sourced from LA dance clubs on New Year's Eve. That's where they found those guys. Jeez. Love it. Oh, oh hilarious. that's fantastic. And, and apparently Kevin Bacon, when he's out at events with DJs, he play, pays the DJs not to play the song. I I love that. But can we talk about the fact that this movie spawned one of my favorite TV moments of all time? And I know it's from the wrong decade, but do you guys remember the will and grace where Kevin Bacon comes on and Jack is obsessed with Kevin Bacon and he like is stalking him and is completely obsessed with him. And then Kevin Bacon ends up becoming friends with will and they start doing the, the, the iconic dance from the movie have you guys never seen that i'm gonna send you the clip oh my god it's hilarious send us the clip and we'll stick it in the show notes yes i'll send you it's really fantastic 
So before we wrap it up, I just wanted to go full circle back to fame because uh, Steve, at the beginning, you were asking if we'd taken a, ever taken a dance lesson. And I didn't until I was much older. But when I was in high school, a senior in high school, I was actually in my high school production of fame. What? I was. I was. So I was just like, I had a few lines. I was one of the like actor kids in the play. And I was part of, you know, the background to, to help flesh out this dance troupe explosion that would happen every once in a while in the cafeteria and then at the end with the big finale. But the teacher who was choreographing it did not seem to think that I had the chops <laughs> because me and my friend Ryan, we were put into the remedial dance group, which was really embarrassing and continues to embarrass me to this day because I love to dance. I love to dance <laughs> and I consider myself a fairly good dancer, but I could not pick up choreography at the time. So I was I just did this very simple move where I like literally moved I don't know, maybe a foot or two down the stage in unison with my friend Ryan. And then we just froze there for the rest of the dance. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Oh yeah, that was not cool. But um, but yeah, that's where I had a moment uh, of a moment of fame. Hey, if you've had a moment of fame out there uh, or have a good dance story from the 80s, uh, send it to us at podcast at sit80s.com. And let's know what you thought of our list. Which movies did we miss out on? Which movies did we uh, not give enough love to? In the meantime, we'll be right back after this commercial break. The Saturday movie will continue after these messages. A sad goodbye on the next all-new episode of Fame. Please don't make me hurt you. It's over. I've done everything but beg. What more do you want from me? I'm dying, man. I'm dying. Don't miss television's best. The next all-new episode of the Emmy Award-winning Fame. Sunday at 5, only on Channel 11. And we're back. We have just a few minutes left. Steve, I want to take those few minutes to thank our Patreon supporters. We have some new supporters. It's been a little while since we thank people, and I want to make sure we uh, let everybody know how much we appreciate it. So this week, we'd like to thank specifically Chip McNamara, Dave in an undisclosed location, although between you and me, I do have his address. <laughs> Tony Great and Amanda Olivas. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we really do appreciate it. And it helps us you know, create more content and keeps the show going. It does. Uh, Jenna Gale, thank you so much for helping uh, guide us through these movies. I can't. It took us a year to put this together, but I think it was worth it. Thanks, Lots Steve. Good luck, with your, good luck with your dance class. <laughs> this is lots of fun. Thank you. Uh, until we come up with another idea for a top 10 list and Steve has to go through another series of awkward uh, lessons, uh, Brad and I, Gail and Jen, remain here, hopelessly stuck in the 80s. Stuck in the 80s is now on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash stuck in the 80s podcast. Special thanks to Check Battery Daily for our theme music, and thanks for listening.